Welcome everybody today to a session on digital ID. So um, this is hosted by us, the Tony Blair Institute for Global Change. Uh, we're a not-for-profit set up to advise leaders and governments around the world. So our government advisory practice is directly supporting leaders on the ground, on the ground, on their fight against COVID-19. And our policy futures unit, which I'm a part of, is delivering analysis and advice to help countries mitigate the economic impact, source equipment, harness the power of technology and position themselves for the rebuilding to come. And this conversation today is uh, about harnessing the power of technology uh, to tackle some of the problems that have been created by the coronavirus pandemic. And today's discussion in particular is about digital ID and how governments can or should use it to help society with some of the problems created. Uh, we're fully taking advantage of our new Zoom lockdown-based world with an excellent panel stretching across over 7,000 kilometres in geography. We have Uddhav Tuari, who is a policy, public policy advisor for Mozilla based in India, specialising in data protection, intermediary liability and access. And Lis Narusk, who is an Estonian technologist and co-founder of an app Immunity Passport in Estonia. Uh, as many of you know, we recently at the Institute published a report on digital ID, which we call the missing piece of the government's exit strategy, recommending the implementation of a mobility credential in the UK linked to a secure and user-centric system of digital identity, and very importantly, setting the policy framework uh, around things like privacy and protection for how the credentials are used in practice. Um, so I will come to Bav first from Mozilla, I want to ask you, Adbav, um, what your, you recently published a white paper on bringing openness to identity. Um, what for you are the key public policy issues around identity and what's been the experience in India in particular? Thank you, Max. Uh, and thank you for this opportunity to speak about Mozilla's work on digital ID so far. Uh, before I get into the sort of specific questions you asked, I thought I'd spend about 30 seconds talking about why Mozilla works on digital ID. Many people associate us with Firefox and our browser, and, it, and they may wonder why is a company like Mozilla working on an area like digital ID where it doesn't really have a product play per se in the field. Um, as so, Mozilla's like primary view of both the internet and technology at large is fa is shaped by its manifesto, and the Mozilla manifesto very clearly says that we believe that privacy is fundamental and should not be treated as optional online. And as a part of that manifesto's work, we have done public policy engagements in Europe, in the United States of America, in India, in Kenya, and in many other countries around the world where we further this ideal of privacy. For us, in the last decade. Digital ID is probably the frontier where this, uh, where this conversation between citizen rights and privacy is taking place in many parts of the world. In many parts of the world, such as in Europe, as well as in the United Kingdom, data protection laws are a standard. They've been around for a fair bit of time, sometimes for as many as two to three decades. And there is a large amount of jurisprudence that actually talks about how citizens should be given the right, their fundamental right to privacy. But in many other parts of the world, and India is an example of one such country, there actually aren't any data protection laws. And despite that, some of the largest digital ID projects in the world have been rolled out, where billion, uh, like more than a billion citizens, for example, in India, have been enrolled in, its, in the Aadhaar, its digital ID program, without there really being a data protection law. And for us, that is fundamentally at conflict with them having a fundamental right to privacy and being able to actualize it not only against the state, but also against private individuals, right? Keeping this sort of broader context in mind, we, we think that there are probably four major issues around digital ID, specifically in the Indian context, but they also apply broadly all over the world. The first is around biometrics. Digital IDs are fundamentally and intrinsically associated with the idea of capturing biometrics. And biometrics are a very unique form of, uni of identifying individuals because unlike a password or a username that you would use in an online service, your biometrics can't be changed. Your fingerprints and your iris scans tend to remain the same throughout your lifetime, barring minimal changes for which they need to be updated. Right now, this actually poses a very specific risk to your privacy, where if these biometrics are either leaked or made available to people at large in a manner that doesn't like follow the consent that you provided for that biometrics, then they can actually be used against you without your consent. And because of that, we believe that all usage of biometrics for digital ID must necessarily be a open 
B, consultative, and C, evidence-based. In India, we've actually seen that the context around which biometrics are used, such as the connectivity and internet connectivity in regions, the digital literacy of the individuals whose biometrics are being collected and then being utilized later on are very, very important. There have been cases that have been documented in the Indian media where there have been over 100 million details of uh, from the Aadhaar database that were inadvertently leaked online due to misconfigured databases from different government programs. While these didn't come out of the UADI, which is the Unique Identification Authority of India, they came because subsidiary like government agencies down the chain did not follow adequate data protection measures in order to protect and protect the information of the citizens that they had. The second issue that we believe is quite important is the issue between there being a choice to use a digital ID and it being made mandatory. In India, we saw feature creep over the time of 10 to 12 years where individuals were increasingly required to use digital ID on more and more government as well as private services. Banks refused to open accounts unless you had a particular digital ID and they didn't really give you a choice of showing other equally valid digital IDs. One of the biggest arguments that was made in the rollout of the Aadhaar was that it will help the uh, people who don't already have digital ID get digital ID in the first place. And, and some of the most recent statistics show that over 99% of the people who ended up got, getting the Aadhaar in India have gotten it on the basis of another ID, which is that they submitted an already valid government ID in order to get this digital government ID in the first place, which really breaks the chain of causation between getting people who don't have IDs on board into government services using a digital ID, because a vast majority of them you already had some form of the government ID. And I think the third and most important issue probably is the issue of government and private surveillance. Because of the fact that digital ID systems usually tend to be centralized, it's very important for us to keep in mind that government and private surveillance risks massively increase. The Aadhaar card, for example, in India has often served as a common identifier that lets advertisers and companies track individuals across multiple services on the internet. And until the Supreme Court of India actually ruled upon this two years ago and, uh, and actually said that private entities can't access the central authorizing database, which is known as a central KYC database in the Aadhaar system, private, you could actually just open up an app, type in your Aadhaar number, get an OTP on your phone via an SMS and be authenticated with your digital ID. And many people were, do, were doing this outside of apps that you traditionally expect them to utilize because it was very easy to get a KYC license from the UADI and, and many private entities ended up exploiting this information. Information. So unless countries have a strong data protection law, follow an open and consultative approach to digital ID, and more importantly, make sure that they, that they are technically auditable and have an honest and frank conversation with the public, we don't believe that digital IDs are necessarily in the interest of citizens until these risks are assaged for. And that's the primary reason we wrote our digital ID paper, which primarily advocates for ways to bring like principles of openness that exist elsewhere onto digital ID so that it can be safer and more secure for everyone around the world. Thanks very much. That's, that's super interesting. And I guess it's a truism to say that the way you implement and integrate digital identity is um, through existing kind of um, culture, social systems and, and legislation and government structures. And which I think is a, is a, and listening to what you were saying about the kind of particular Way that things have been implemented are interesting and, and a good to contrast um, with Lise um, from Estonia and I think it's again another truism to say that in any conversation about digital identity um, or e-government you have to bring somebody from Estonia in. Uh, so uh, could you reflect on, um, on your experience of digital identity and the work you're doing in particular with the new immunity passport app linked to the coronavirus pandemic? Yeah, hi Max and uh, and hi everybody and thank you for for having me. Uh, it's it's an honor to participate in this discussion. Um, you, you had kind of two questions in one. I'm trying to tackle the first one about Estonia first. Uh, so I think it first we have to make clear uh, that um, when we talk about Estonia, I think uh, and Estonians like to use the same um, analogy that Estonia is kind of like a digital Narnia. To, to the rest of the world, because we have had our uh, digital signatures, e-governance systems in place uh, already for several decades. Um, Estonia is a country where 99% of, of people have Estonian national ID cards. Uh, 
67% uh, of us use it regularly, 91% uh, uh, use the internet regularly, 99% of our public services are usable online 24-7 <laughs> and, and all our uh, Basically, e Estonia backbone is the um, is the X road system, which is open source, free data exchange layer between public and private institutions, and uh, and it's also important to say that our legal identity is the same as digital identity, or digital identity is the same as legal identity. So we we all have just one identity, and of course the data is owned by people and that stated in the law already, I think back in the 2000s, at the beginning of 2000s. So that being said, uh, I think uh, for me personally, it's hard to, uh, I understand the problems that many, many countries and especially countries a lot larger than Estonia with our 1.3 million people are having uh, because we're kind of already used to living in this in this Narnia, and when we go outside, then many things become like so like unimaginable to us. How is it possible that you have to go to file your taxes on paper somewhere? How is it possible that you that you need to go uh, to get your driver's license uh, um, prolonged when in Estonia it just pops into your into your mailbox after you have ticked the box online and signed it digitally? So, um, so basically there are only three events in Estonia when you have to get out of the house, uh, getting married, getting a divorce and buying a house. So, and actually the buying a house part, I think since a couple of months also ha now, it's possible to do notary, uh, sign notary papers online. So we're kind of in a, in a completely different place in that sense. And, and Estonia has done a couple of crucial decisions back in the at the end of 1990s, uh, where first of all uh, our government made this, uh, I think, quite unpopular uh, decision at the time that we make the digital the ID card mandatory, uh, even when people didn't quite yet understand like how could it be used besides you know just showing uh, proving your identity. Uh, but we we luckily had a couple of visionaries, including our former prime minister Marplar, who who kind of saw the vision like decades uh, in advance, and and they were pretty certain that making sure that we have the legislation in place that you also mentioned mentioned about uh, about the, the the legal system that is super strong and transparent, and people understand who the data belongs to. In Estonia, data belongs. Your data belongs to yourself uh, as a citizen. Uh, it's always traceable. Who sees your data? What they do with your data? And it's also written in law that you can uh, uh, basically there are there are punishments following if your data is being used uh, in a way that is uh, that is uh, that you haven't uh, basically given consent to. So. All these things combined, uh, this is kind of the, the, the digital Narnia I'm talking about. And, and of course, the, the underlying reason for that was that uh, when we gained our independence back in the uh, 1990s, like, there was nothing. There was no underlying system. Uh, there was Soviet Union before. Now we uh, had a young republic. All systems needed to be built from scratch. And to build a fully functioning country from scratch, uh, while knowing we cannot afford the bureaucracy of a developed democracy, we had to kind of put all these new legisla uh, legislations and regulations in place. And so has that's that the system? Yeah, and has that, um, and then coming to the coronavirus pandemic, has that made it um, easier to implement systems? So we talk about in the institute about the containment architecture, which a digital identity system for mobility would be an important element of that. Um, how what, how is your have you been involved in those systems and has that been easier? I have to say that uh, the, the pandemic, when everybody needed to also sit in their homes and work from their homes uh, for several months, like nothing changed, in a sense that we still get to do our our pile our taxes uh, to make bank bank transactions like all this is, is already there. So there is 
over 600 uh, services available digitally, government services, uh, for uh, private citizens and over 2,500 for legal entities. So in that sense, uh, I think the only thing that was added during the pandemic was the notary, notary deals. Uh, but it actually started already before, so it was just kind of finalized during that time. So definitely, yes, it made things a lot easier as we could just, you know, carry on with our, with our daily course and, and nothing much changed in that sense. I heard that there was some, uh, some like struggle in the actual, uh, like the government uh, work, uh, because actually the solutions had been there uh, before. Uh, because we, for example, have this e-cabinet system where where um, it's a it's a multi-user database and and schedule, scheduler uh, that keeps relevant information organized and updated in real time and and the cabinet meetings uh, can be held online completely and fully. Uh, but I think uh, they were just used to it, so they were forced also to kind of use it even more during the pandemic. Interesting. And, and so um, if I bring you, bring you back in, um, how, how important and possible would you say are, are digital ID systems and around mobility credentials to help solve some of the problems of the coronavirus, the coronavirus pandemic in India uh, and in other places you've looked at around the world? Uh, I think that the question uh, is necessarily a contextual one. There are certainly, I think, some use cases where uh, say with regard to people who've been tested for the coronavirus so people who have antibodies against the coronavirus uh, say have an app on their phone that lets them prove with some amount of reliability that they are individuals who can be say allowed to travel or return to work in sensitive areas such as schools and universities and and there are I think a bunch of use cases that one can think of but uh, a lot of this I think can firstly be done without necessarily being tied to the idea of digital ID uh, because many of these things uh, are things that say whether uh, in India, if you look at India's contact tracing app, which is the Arogya Setu app, uh, it like was, I think, downloaded by over 80 to 90 million people in India and, and was installed on their phones, but even before the code that was underlying behind the app was made open source. And even now, the, the server side code, which is the actual entity that is collecting a lot of the data that is being generated from this app, hasn't really been made uh, available in, in any open source platform yet, even though it was promised that it would happen, I think, about two weeks ago. And I think that that showcases the risk, right, that even if you were to, firstly, there are all the risks that come with digital ID as a whole that will now so, sort of transpose themselves to a medical use case, which makes it significantly, I think, like more dangerous because the, uh, like, I think it's one thing to say that if somebody associated with a digital ID number number is like safe from Corona and that information leaks, that's one thing. But I think that information leaking for someone who's not safe from the Corona has a completely other sort of risk of privacy, like privacy dimensional risk, right? Where for example, imagine uh, my app uh, with my government digital ID, which is the Aadhaar actually says that I've been tested for the COVID virus yesterday and today I find out that I'm positive. And this information for, for um, positive to COVID is associated with my digital ID. Now, the risk of this information leaking out, leaking out into the media, if I'm a celebrity, uh, leaking out into my social circle or even being put on, say, a list somewhere by the government, because uh, in India, at the beginning of the lockdown, there were actually PDFs with thousands of names and addresses and phone numbers along with the fact that these people were COVID positive that were actually making the rounds on WhatsApp. And these were authentic lists that were sometimes even released by local police departments. And you and you had instances of these houses being picketed, uh, vendors refusing to serve these houses, people calling the cops on those houses saying, look, these people have COVID, why are they not in institutional quarantine? Take them away from here. We don't want to live next to them. So a lot of the associative risk with like private information leaking only increases if you associate medical information with digital ID. So I think there is a credible argument to be made that if you can utilize, if you can prove with some reliability using a phone on someone's uh, app on someone's phone, that this person is safe or has is not like positive to Corona, then we should follow that rather than necessarily going down the digital ID route. Um, and even if that were to happen, I think there are like concerns of transparency and data protection where if you do use digital ID for tracking whether people are safe from Corona or not, it's really important a to do so in a man to do so in a manner that is transparent and and collects the minimal amount of data that is possible. For example, it may not be necessary to take a person's name or a phone number, but just the fact that that this ID number is in fact safe from Corona, right? Like there's no other personal information mm. associated with it, which is actually how many contact tracing apps currently work. 
uh, and second i think is also the question that there needs to be a dedicated legal framework for this like there should be a law passed by the parliament of a democracy uh, and and sort of like that withstands judicial scrutiny that says the government can actually do this i think we'll find that because governments want to rule this out very quickly they may just pass an executive order or pass an ordinance or like jump start the parliamentary process that they would traditionally have to follow for something as important as this so it's very important that both of these steps are followed so that everyone in the country accepts that this is something that they want to do and is not something that is just forced upon them so I think it's a very interesting point, and I think that's to reflect from the UK is, is part of the model we proposed as, as well, is that you need this underlying legal framework, which has principles of openness and, and data protection in there. Um, but, but even more, to take it up, up a layer as well, that we are already seeing that different organisations and, and schools, private schools, um, the Premier League, and um, big businesses such as banks in the city of London will start developing their own containment architecture and infrastructure, which potentially creates a, a massive digital divide between those people who can get access to certain places because of the investment that private companies have made. Uh, and that the government not investing in these systems is creates this separation in, in a two tier society where, where risk is kind of held by one group, unknowable risk is held by one group, but not by another. Um, Lise, can you reflect on the kind of contract tracing element um, of this debate? And so we, we, when we talk about this, we try and separate out the mobility credentials from the contact, contact tracing uh, element of the discussion. Um, I wonder if, if, if you can say what, what is the kind of key ingredients of, um, uh, you've developed the, the immunity passport, and I wonder if you can say a bit about that. Yeah, there are. There is actually the the contact tracing app uh, also developed uh, in Estonia, not rolled out yet. Uh, it's more uh, of a of a cluster of of government and private, like public private partnership initiative. Uh, when we talk about the immunity passport uh, that we are developing, I think it's important to mention first that the, we have now realized ourselves also that maybe the immunity passport name in itself is a bit misleading because for the future record it it is basically a wallet that contains your health data uh, that you want to see there and that you want to share as a citizen and uh, with someone or show to someone uh, so uh, immunity passport uh, in its current uh, state is a not-for-profit organization done uh, by uh, several Estonian key entrepreneurs uh, the co-founder of TransferWise um, uh, ex-CEO of Swedbank Estonia, uh, a lot of uh, really high-level experts in, uh, in public health and, uh, and uh, health law. So, uh, and, and we came up, the idea in itself is not novel. So, uh, so the idea was circulating around uh, in very many countries in the world. And when the pandemic began, so in Estonia, we have a quite tiny and mighty startup community and we kind of virtually sat together in, in a Slack group and, uh, and were wondering what we could be done. And we decided to explore this immunity passport, uh, the controversial idea of immunity passport from uh, like a startup point of view, because we, we figured that for the government, it's really tricky to experiment with an idea like that. They can't really take those risks, but us as a completely independent entrepreneurs, we can uh, explore some paths of how this could be developed in a in a very sensible and like respecting people's privacy and data and all that the questions that that you mentioned. So uh, currently, it's uh, it's based on Estonian national ID. Uh, you uh, basically log in with your uh, with your ID card or mobile ID or smart ID, which are all several uh, ID systems provided uh, by the state in Estonia. You can curate a database of a patient portal where your uh, test results are held, or it can be in the future a lab. It, uh, it depends a bit the integration that, uh, that are on the way. Uh, and then you can basically see your, your COVID-19 test results currently, be it, be it an antibody test, be it PCR, the no swipe test, be it uh, in vaccination in the future, whatnot. So we like to call it test agnostic. Uh, and, uh, and in the future, it, it can hold uh, whatever critical uh, health data that, uh, that is necessary. Uh, and then you can share it with your employer, with your, uh, with your neighbor, with, your, with the elderly, whomever you wish. Uh, and the, the important thing is, yes, that it's completely open source. 
it's it's nobody has access to it like third party access uh, we have been very transparent with it from the very beginning we have been in close discussion with the government just to make sure that you know is this something we can we can explore together and they have been very positive so far i think it has to do with estonia's you know again digital history that we are used to exploring these new uh, concepts in an experimental way and uh, and also uh, so after you have uh, have have seen your test results you can then share by showing but in the future of course we would like to make it even more like um, easy to use uh, you can share digitally with whomever you want because in estonia you already do share your data with with basically whoever whoever you want based on your own free will so again we come back to this legislation and societal agreements that need to be in place in order to do these developments mm. or these kind of solutions okay very interesting um so we're going to um open it up to the uh, virtual floor now so anybody um who's in attendance please put up your hand for comments we've had a couple of questions come in that um that would be interesting to discuss um about the kind of viability of uh viability of coronavirus uh, of immunity passports by themselves um so i'll come first to tom fisher um, if you just kind of introduce yourself your name and where you're from and then i'll open your mic hi tom hi tom i'm uh, tom fisher from privacy international um and i just wanted to make the point first of all we know from experience that linking health to people's ID can be very dangerous. There are cases in India where once um, HIV AIDS treatment was linked to um, people's ADA numbers, they no longer sought treatment because of the very fears that, um, that the speaker from Mozilla expressed. You know, these, these are genuine dangers and fears. We've seen similar things with linking, um, linking medical data to biometrics um, and protests in Kenya and other places around the world where people uh, are, um, are affected. So um, particularly in the context of us, not the current state of not knowing the nature of immunity and um, whether actually immunity is a thing at all, you know, aren't we very premature to be even talking about this? Um, and I note that there are players in this space who have been pushing for, you know, digital identity um, long before the long before the virus was in place. And kind of the fear is that they are using the virus to spread digital identity rather than digital identity as a tool to fight the virus. You know, and that is kind of that's a deeply problematic position to be in, given the risks and dangers surrounding digital IDs, both in terms of fighting the virus and in general. So, um, so the, the issues are, you know, are we not you know, very premature to be having these kind of conversations when we don't understand immunity, therefore we don't know what shape it's going to take, therefore we don't know what these kind of digital identity solutions need to look like in the first place uh, yeah sure. um, thank, thank you i'm happy to pick up yeah, on that I'd one just, if it's okay. just yeah that, please do i'll just make a note that um anybody else also kind of on the on the attendee list um can respond to these as well if you if you want to um but least go ahead yeah um it's Absolutely, you're absolutely right, uh, and thank you for the question uh, that, uh, about the, the state of immunity. And uh, I didn't mention uh, that before, but when we started out uh, this developing this Im immunity passport or health wallet or however you call it, the uh, solution, um, we agreed that if we wait uh, for the science to be absolutely ready with the answer of immunity and the parameters of immu immunity uh, regards to coronavirus, uh, we lose a lot of time because we are pretty certain uh, that uh, we will know for sure, maybe even in, in a couple of months time, there seems to be an agreement so far that immunity does develop, just the parameters are, are unclear. But uh, given that 
it will we will know these answers because with all the previous diseases it has it has come also uh, we are hoping that we will save valuable time and probably million millions of euros and dollars if we are ready by the time when the answer to immunity is certain but again making sure that uh, that everybody understands how we approach this is that it it doesn't only hold your information about immunity as such it can also hold your pcr test results which is just to the identify if you have the virus or not and coming back to the other question which i think is a bit of a separate question about uh, linking it to uh, to your identity maybe i'm not 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 the right person to to comment but uh, as as mentioned estonia has had digital identity for 20 years plus we have had zero problems with data leakage with technological like issues none we have had um in 2017 we had some issues with the with the chip on the uh, on the id card that contained your um uh, uh signature keys but that's the only issue we had and and um, what i'm saying is technologically uh, technolo technology is already there where, where these solutions can be developed with extreme uh, security in mind and openness and transparency. It's more of a question of legislation and societal agreements uh, than technology. So that's my take on it. I think that's a really interesting point, and then Tom, I'll give you a chance to to come back on that at the moment. Um, but um, that's you. Sure. Tom, go first. I'm happy to go as well. No? Oh, you, um, if you go first, above, and then we'll come back Good. to come back Great. to sure. Tom. Sure. Uh, no, I mean, I I think that like the risks that Tom pointed out are incredibly valid, and like I mean, the example on the Aadhaar and HIV AIDS in India, I think, uh, just goes to show that. Uh, this is not like I think while I agree with Liz about specifically the fact that like depending on the context, the population, the digital literacy, that the technology itself may be there for this to be carried out in a reasonably secure manner. I, I think that at the end of the day, uh, the problem with centralized systems is that while the data may be stored centrally, it's very, very easy for replications of that data, maybe not the entirety of the database, but subsets of that database to be created by uh, government agencies that aren't primarily tasked with keeping it safe and secure. So, for example, in India, um, we have something called state resident data hubs, in uh, which were essentially databases that states in India created at the same time as which people were enrolling for the Aadhaar. So they were like, okay, so we will send one copy of this information to the UADI for the Aadhaar, and we will keep this other copy of this information for us. And and it, it was associated with caste information, with with uh, economic class like classifiers and many other things, and were actually available online on websites for for that weren't of course open to the public at large, but were still open to far more people than what you anyone would be comfortable with this data being available for, right? And I think that associating health data alongside that just goes to show that additional sort of risk that is possible. All of that said, however, I do think that like there there may be some benefits that is that is that arise out of letting people know whether they are positive or not positive from covid it, it's just that like we should explore the potential of doing that without necessarily associating it with digital id because if it's possible and like if for example if like there are there is a qr code that's present literally on a piece of paper that's an encrypted qr code that if you can scan you simply get a yes or a no answer and without getting to know anything else about that person, hypothetically speaking, and in a very sort of on the fly, like off the cuff example, is far better than a digital ID app that actually assigns you a number and actually tracks all of this in a manner that also has many of the security risks that come alongside it. So I think that we should keep exploring the possibilities of doing this without digital ID or without at least associating uh, sensitive personal information with the immunity or the lack of it. And I think from from our perspective, that's that's the kind of model we've been espousing is is actually one that like designs the privacy framework early on, the recognition that this is a is a potentially important benefit, and and, uh, and also make sure that you design a framework where you don't reveal necessary information. So um, otherwise, what we end up with is a situation where where we're going in. You asked to show your ID in in different places or your contact your records to be stored somewhere, but actually um, you're giving away far more information then you might want to, whereas a decentralized IC, ID system with a QR code that would give you nothing more than the required information 
might be a better way of doing it. I'm just going to, um, Tom, do you want to have 30 seconds on that? I'm going to come to Jonathan Crowcroft after that. No, no. Um, thank you very much. I will just flag that Estonia is a bit of an unusual case and they already have kind of this digital ID framework largely in place. Um, and so, you know, replicating that as a model elsewhere where we don't have that in place, you know, it becomes a driving force for introducing these digital IDs. And now is not the time to introduce a giant digital ID system because, you know, we are busy with other things and can't give it the proper interrogation that is necessary before introducing such a system. Great. Thanks, Tom. Um, and then, um, Jonathan, I will come to you. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, um, I'm with um, uh, Tom on this. Uh, I think it's inappropriate to start trying to fix digital ID. There are a lot, lot of reasons the UK is a very complicated space, but a lot of parts of the world where half the population don't have devices or they share devices, which makes it mind-bogglingly complicated. So I'm, um, but also in the, in the, the COVID-19 situation, uh, for contact tracing, if you're going to do it with a the device, then the device is what you need. Uh, the matching it to a person you can do when you do tests um, for uh, immunity passports there's a major issue you do, firstly we have immunity visas you get a yellow fever certificate I have one that's 30 years old it's good for life I don't need digital ID to show that and going between uh, Tanzania and Kenya for example uh, or different parts of South America so it works and it works for everyone pretty well and it's hard to forge so that's not digital but but in COVID-19 we have a a big problem, which is while uh, antibody uh, tests are getting quite good, and later today there'll be the Cochrane report on all the tests done so far on different antibody tests will be out. It's not out yet, but it comes out of embargo later today. The numbers are, are not good, but there's a much worse um, problem, which is expiry. And it's not worth building a system uh, a whole new system when we don't know what the expiry is. We don't know that for any of the vaccines on the trial either. Um, and the expiry could be uh, below a year. And so um, really, um, not only do we not know the risk level, the sort of false positive, false negative rate for the test, um, we don't know the infectiousness of somebody coming out of immunity um, uh, towards other people. They may have some immunity, but still be able to carry a weak version and be risky to other people, and then obviously be at risk themselves. So, so the medical side does not inform a good technical decision at this point. So, while I, you know, I, I'm a total fan of the Estonian digital citizenship systems, and it, it does enable a bunch of things, and they've got some great designs in, you know, citizenship ownership of how uh, data is, is shared and so on it's all good and I'm a massive fan I think the um, uh, Tony Blair Institute suggestions for the digital ID system are good I don't think linking it to COVID-19 is the great plan at this point I think it's mixing things up um, we don't need it for the contact tracing if the app does get revived uh, the decentralized version of the app doesn't need it at all um, and we don't really need it for some kind of uh, risk level for people that have been antibody tested in fact we have an id system for the nhs which is pretty decent um, so why have a single digital id the problem i put in the chat actually the problem really is for the uk is federating a bunch of existing legacy id systems and that's where people commented on the, the verify failure in the uk and i think part of that was just the complexity of that just killed everything that, that and recidivism in some government departments um, we now have better te technical designs Estonia is a leading one um, and there are others I think the the report from Tony Blair to this global change is is good on a design too so um, we should we should go forward on that but I just wouldn't couple it to current events it seems like a um, it seems like the wrong um, complexity to throw into the picture and it doesn't it doesn't solve the problem really of coming out of uh, the, the, the current COVID setup. I don't see it accelerating anything there um, beyond what okay. uh, is being done anyway. Yeah. That's very useful. Thank you. I'm just going to bring in um, Richard Pope. Um, well, he's put his hand down. And Richard, if you uh, want to make a comment, because it's useful to have your experience ex um, government digital service. Uh, Hello, can you hear me? Hi, Richard. <laughs> yeah. Um, it was a really quick comment. Actually. It was, wondering to what extent the language we use around identity cards identity system certificates is like gets in the way sometimes and that policy makers the people who ultimately end up making the policy decisions don't necessarily understand the affordances of the underlying digital technology because they're like oh it's it's like a paper certificate it's like a, a physical identity card 
and we almost end up regardless of, sort of good work that's done around federation and um auditability and um verifiable facts the picture that senior policymakers and politicians end up with in the head is a single central system so like, is that a genuine problem is language a problem and if so how can we start to change it a bit Lisa, Bev, do you want to reflect on, on that language point? I think it's really interesting given the development of different systems in your country. Sorry, I have to say, I, I, I'm not really clear what you mean by language point in national ID systems. Is it the question of national language or some other language that I'm, I don't get? Uh, the fact that we tend to talk about a single digital identity or a single digital account yeah again um in estonia there is one single digital identity and it's a legal identity it's a physical identity it's a digital identity and that's that's how it's written in in the law since 1990s and uh and and also the system is decentralized in estonia so we don't have uh, one central database to hold people's data and uh, we also have on top of that uh, cloud databases and uh, physical databases outside of Estonia to cover all the the possible cyber attack risks and and so forth. So in in that sense, I'm, I'm not sure if I answered your question, but um, but uh, my point is listening to all the, the concerns and debates here before. I think we are really in Estonia. We're tr struggling uh, to see the the value in keeping things on paper or developing things on paper uh, when we have uh, the right technological solutions in place to enhance security and enhance the overall dec decrease the time uh, needed to prove who you are to, to to go about with your daily daily things uh, and and being in discussions with ministry of social affairs uh, in estonia uh, weekly uh, about our, our progress in developing this then they are extremely happy that we can finally make the vaccination passport into a digital version again uh, it might might depend on our our like digital literacy and and maturity overall but uh, but given that Estonia is also advising several governments in the world, including Canada, Iceland, Finland is now using the X-Road system and ID system similar to Estonia, meaning I can go with my medical prescription to Finland's pharmacy, give them my ID card, which they plug into the system and they pull out the, the, the medicine needed for me. So again, I think this cross-border uh, agreements, pan-European agreements on how this can be approached on a digital level because you can't really go about with your with your papers that are I think easily you know you can easily make up any papers or draw draw any papers for uh, for whomever and show whosoever data on a paper and it's much more tricky to do that if you have a have a smart digital tool for that. I think this is, um, but I might invite you to have any comments on this in a second, but I think this is a very important point, Richard, about the, the kind of different levels of understanding and the different, and how you how you transform an idea, which is both kind of um, deep policy frameworks around privacy and, and government um, digital systems to enable the modern state to work uh, alongside a user experience and maybe use suspicion of privacy. And then top, top with that, the, the politics of the situation as well, the history that we have in in, in our, in different countries around this. Um, so the language is uh, extremely important and quite a, a difficult one to get right without introducing, well, to have a, a kind of genuine conversation about the kind of the frameworks that you might put in place as well as the idea in itself. Um, but do you have any reflections on that? And then I'll come to um, Carolina Aang. Sure, thanks, Max. I mean, I, mean, I think that uh, with regard to the questions of centralization, uh, the diversity in different forms of identity that exist in countries, at least let's take India for an example, that have over a billion people. And at any given point in time, an average citizen is expected to have something for getting pub like for public delivery of services or so like for ration. So there's a ration card, there's your driver's license, there's 
like you may have a health insurance card like from the state health insurance service uh, and uh, then you may have a passport uh, for travel you may have a pan card for taxation and so that's just like an average person who has a bank account will probably have it five different ids and uh, it's very commonly used as an example as an example of something that's bad that says like why do you need five ids when you can have one but actually the fact that these five different ids exists I think is a good thing, right? Like it, it actually showcases diversity of choice. It prevents centralization. It makes federation much easier to happen. And uh, what it also lets the person do is it lets them pick and choose what they want to participate and what they don't want to participate in, right? Like, so if I don't want to say use a particular ID for a particular thing, especially with private entities, then I don't have to do so anymore. And I have the choice to do that. Um, and I think it's also important, like, I mean, sort of also responding to something that Liz said that it's important to sort of distinguish, I think, um, Estonia's example with regard to the, the sheer extent of its population that's already online, that is digitally illiterate, and that are comfortable using the digital ID versus many other examples all over the world where, um, because technically in India, like over a billion people are on the Aadhaar, right? But like the percentage of that number that have actually used, like been onto the internet and even checked out their Aadhaar profile on the browser is a minuscule fraction of that. Like by most, like, Con conservative estimates, like I think that number would be something like lesser than 100 million. And if it's a little better, it may be 150 million or something like that. So it's important for us to keep that distinction in mind that while you may empower people with things, they may not necessarily have the ability to use it, utilize it safely and to protect themselves and that we should keep that in mind. And I, there's also a second point that I wanted to make that I also saw that was brought up a fair bit in the chat and in the Q&A is that at the end of the day, I think this is also a question that medical experts necessarily need to be involved in, like the question of immunity, the question of can, how soon can you get it, the question of antibodies and how they work. And and the general efficacy of this idea is something that like really needs to be, I think, I don't know if there's enough research to justify rolling out the infrastructure without having the medical science to back up whether it would necessarily work or not. And at best, I think they should happen in parallel, but quite likely the medical science should come first, then we should understand the answers to these questions and then proceed to like start building the framework so that they can sort of complement each other. Yeah, very interesting. If I may, if I may on, the, on the point that uh, you have made on the, having five different uh, or, or different options uh, for using different identities in different, different situations, then I think uh, I might be the, playing the bad cop here again, but uh, but having seen it from the user's perspective in Estonia also, um, having all my, you know, even I don't even have to carry my driver's license because if I have this, I have it all in here. So um, going with this to the pharmacy, going with this to the bank and so on and so on. So uh, from the user's perspective and user experience point of view, uh, I think it's extremely important that these systems are convenient for the user and don't cause additional confusion in you know what card or what identity is used for what and where can i opt in where can i opt out but having more in that sense like a centralized system for this uh, and at one access point to several systems uh, be it the physical card be it the mobile id and smart id that we have in estonia meaning we have a multitude of options that you can use. An important thing is also that you can always go there physically also, but people don't do that anymore. They don't go to the bank. They don't go to the, to the where you get your uh, driver's license because they see that it's so convenient uh, to use the, the systems that are, are, mm. are designed keeping the user in mind. Interesting. So. Okay. I'm just going to um, give Richard kind of 30 seconds if he wants to come back any of on any of that or make any other comments uh, only really quickly that i think the the international example is a really it, it, that's it, it cross-border applications are really interesting way to frame it because i think that does get get you out of that conversation about single identity systems versus um more federated ones because i think the nature of the world is that the second you look outside the borders of a single country we're in a world that is federated so how do we kind of design and optimize for that yeah, very interesting. Entirely agree. Um, thank you. Uh, so um, I will just bring in Ian Corby now instead. Ian, um, thanks, Max. Asked? Yes, thanks. Um, I think you know, lots of people have have memories of the impact of HIV and AIDS in terms of your ability to get life insurance or health insurance, or even a mortgage. And we haven't seen that um, consequence of COVID yet. 
um, but depending on how the de disease develops, it may follow. So I think people are going to want to have complete confidence that they have control over their own data and they decide what is shared and with whom. Um, and one of the things we have experience of in the UK, of course, is implementing um, age verification for pornographic websites where you know, users were very, very sensitive about their identity being associated with the proof of age. And, and that may be a model, it wasn't perfect and it would need to be better protected by, by laws and regulation. But that, that is a model where you could divorce your um, proof of your COVID status or immunity status from your own identity, but still police it in such a way that you had a very high level of confidence that it was valid. Thanks, Ian. Um, any reflections on on the kind of, I guess there's there's this point here on age, age verification in the UK that digital identity systems um, may or may not be the, the right solution for the coronavirus pandemic, but they do then open up other opportunities. And I think um, on the chat, um, Rob has put an in, uh, interesting study from McKinsey about um, EID enabling transformation of productivity and economic growth, which I think lists as, as referenced in um, implicitly in, in, in a lot of what she said. Um, so what are the opportunities as well? So if you design the right, the right framework for um, age verification that does protect you and you, um, sorry, design the right framework for digital identity, um, which has the right protections in place and recognizes the lessons we've learned from other, um, other issues before, um, what are the opportunities available to you? Adab, do you want to reflect on that? No, I mean, I, I think that like there are some tangible opportunities, right? Like I think that even in our white paper that where we talk about digital ID, we actually use Estonia as an example of a country that's done digital ID well. Like, I mean, we, we and, and the benefits that it's accrued to, to the citizens, like citizenry in Estonia at large are undeniable. So, uh, but I think it's much more a question of like, how to utilize that opportunity contextually, right? Like depending on the country where the digital ID system is being rolled out, what are the ways in which you can minimize the harms that may arise out of it, right? Like for example, in India, with regard to the Aadhaar, one of the first suggestions that civil society made when the project was being discussed in 2009 was please follow Estonia's model. Why don't you use smart cards? Smart cards have chip in them. There's, there's cryptography in them. It lets you like revoke them. Like if if, if, your, if your smart card leak, like information leaks, you can flush it down the toilet and get another smart card with a new chip, right? Like the, all, all of these are inherent systems that I think even the payment sector has showed us like work reasonably well, right? Like there are, of course, security risks associated with credit and debit cards, but for the billions of people that use them all over the world, they've worked reasonably well for a, for a fair amount of time. And I think all of those are questions of opportunity, but even just using that financial transaction payment thing as an example, for example, in India, the Reserve Bank of India has mandated that every time you use a debit or a credit card online, there needs to be a second factor of authentication. You need to get an OTP on your phone that you then need to type in on the website before you can utilize the card. And the only reason that was included was because of digital literacy, because people were afraid that they would, that like the bank was afraid people would just give up their credit and debit cards with their numbers and be subject to financial fraud and they didn't want to take that risk, which is a perfect example of a global system that works in one way and India adopting that system but with some additional safeguards in order to make sure that the risk is lower. So I think those are the sort of opportunities that we need to look for, not just opportunities of utilization, but also util opportunities of improvement of how can you make small changes that may increase the friction that users have to undergo a little bit, but still allow them to broadly achieve the same outcome, keeping their local context in mind. And I think that local context is often forgotten when we speak of digital ID in a sort of interoperable format, but, and, that, and without that local context, I think the harms far outweigh the benefits, but with that local context, I think that's the beginning of a sustainable conversation for how these things can take place. That's great. And um, Liz, do you want uh, one minute on this and then I'll wrap up the session? Yeah, I com completely agree with you on that. I'm just uh, I'm looking all the statistics about uh, the, the potential um, upsides of using the digital tools and ID and helping citizens to, you know, do the important things in their lives, like... Uh, do do what they want, celebrate their life, spend time with their family instead of filing taxes for several hours. Then I th I think the upside still way 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 more than the the potential 
threats that can already be uh, to, with today's technology can be mitigated and uh, and just the simple fact that our our like government cabinet meetings have gone from five hours weekly down to average 30 minutes weekly because of the option to use digital solutions then that's a huge win for the taxpayer also it's reducing paperwork it's reducing uh, time and effort for the for the cabinet members and so on so and that's just one example of of enabling uh, the digital identity to work in its best so to say so um, i still am am strongly for being the citizen and uh, and very like tightly connected to to our developments here uh, in estonia that uh, there are options to do this in the right way and of course keep, keeping in mind the local context but Thanks, Luce. And thanks for both for a very, very interesting discussion and nice to have a bit of um, debate about uh, different systems and in different geographies. I think Richard's comment about the interoperability of systems is important and I guess there's an interoperability of the debate and the policy framework as well that we need to consider here. Um, so thank you very much everybody for listening in to this, um, this session. Um, if you have any feedback, um, please contact Andrew, who you should all have an email from or get in touch with us on our social channels um, and we'll be publishing a summary. Thank you for everybody who's also published um, various bits and pieces on the chat and um, very interesting conversation going on there as well. Um, so thank you very everybody very much for your time. <laughs>